grandfather wasn't a brute. He was mind-numbingly mediocre. He was an ordinary man who moved from one bad thing to the next, to the next, to the next. He slipped into a category of crimes that had he perhaps at the very beginning been shown where he would be going, he might have been a bit shocked. Although he was an early member of the Nazi party, he was relatively late to signing up for a right-wing organization. I mean, people had been doing this since, since the early 1920s. I think maybe it had something to do with his landlord, who was a very keen Nazi. And that same landlord, when my grandfather was out of work with a wife and three children to support, knew a man who was very senior in the SS and had gone to the same school as my grandfather. And so he arranged for my grandfather to meet Heinrich Himmler's deputy. And then he was offered a job and that involved six months away from the family to be trained as an officer of the SS. And that would be where the radicalization began and ended. And he went willingly, he must have done. He was, he was 35, 40, 40 years old by then. This wasn't an impressionable youth. This was a man who was mature and knew what he was doing. And so, you know, he, he had it in him to be radicalized. And I think it was something that maybe he was happy to, to do. When the First World War broke out, he signed up on the first day. And within a fortnight, he was heading for the Belgian border. And it's quite clear that he was involved in some of the bloodiest battles of the war. So he fought at Mont, he fought at Marne, he fought on the Somme. He was finally wounded at Passchendaele and taken prisoner by the French and then he was taken to a prisoner of war camp in Brittany. And there he stayed, not just until the end of the First World War, but for 15 months afterwards, because the German soldiers, the German prisoners of war, were held until the Versailles Treaty had been signed. So he was then going back to Germany in March 1920, to a country that was in a state of economic collapse. And he'd left that country, a country that thought it was gonna win the First World War by Christmas. So I often think, what was it like for men like him to return to this country? You know, what, to, what resentments did that build up in them? And I think, and I can never prove this, but I, I think that was fundamental to, to what drove him. Initially, he was an auditor for the SS at Dachau, not within the concentration camp, but next door. And part of his training, he would have, he would have served as a guard at Dachau. So he would have got a sense of, of what the SS was like and what a concentration camp was like. And the men were supposed to fraternize with each other. It was quite a small unit at that time. He, I calculated that he was socializing with at least 10 men who went on to be commandants of places like Auschwitz. So he was mixing with some pretty nasty characters. And then by 1938, the SS had by then realized that there was a huge intake of, of, of Jews and, and other people that they considered undesirables. And they worked out that they could make money out of them. They didn't pay them, but they got them to work. And so the whole thing was then 
shifted to Berlin and my grandfather was moved to Berlin to, to work within the, the central office. But most of his work was going to the various concentration camps. In effect, they were his factories and the slave laborers were his employees. And he would go from camp to camp and make sure that they had materials to, to make things. And he would also um, act as an auditor for the SS. And if you know anything about accounting, you'll know that an accountant knows exactly how the company works. So he knew exactly what was going on in the concentration camps. So he knew the level of brutality and the atrocities that were taking place in the camps. Oh yes, with, without doubt. I mean, there, there is a set of accounts that he prepared saying that at, at Lemberg, um, productivity stopped in November 1943 because of the special action. The word is Sonderaktion, which is a euphemism for a mass massacre. So he knew the number of men who were, who were shot. He knew the date. That kind of information was only available to the senior SS. He also had an account item for two railway carriages of clothes. Clothes of people who had been gassed at Auschwitz. So those minute details recorded dispassionately by this man said that he knew exactly what was going on. In March 1945, when he was told that he would be moved to the Alps, he firmly believed at that point that Germany would still win the war. His wife was packing just about everything she could manage. And he said to her, you know, why are you packing so much stuff? In a few weeks, we'll be coming back. So I think he, he genuinely believed what Hitler and Goebbels were telling him. And I also think that he was disappointed at the end of the war, but I think he was disappointed at the outcome. I don't think he believed that what he had done was wrong, just like so many in the SS. And indeed, um, reading the, the, the account of his trial and the the account of the trial judge and the prosecution, one of the, the points that was made against him was that he showed no contrition and no remorse for what he did. You know, he was, he was in the SS for 10 years and there's no, there's no evidence that he did anything to, to, to pull back from what he was doing. Obviously, we don't know what sort of pressures were on him. But, but he carried on working. Well, my dad kept everything under wraps about his childhood until his sister died uh, nine years ago. And then he suddenly started telling me about his childhood in Berlin, which I hadn't even realized he'd spent the whole war in Berlin. And, and eventually my, my wife had a conference in Berlin and, and I said to my dad, look, I'll, I'll go along and I'll take photo photographs of your house. So he gave me the address of the, the house, the road where he lived. And I simply looked online to see if there was anything historical about this house and the street. And up came a form, and it was a charge sheet, and it said, SS, Hauptsturmführer, Karl Niemann, Crimes Against Humanity, Use of Slave Labour. And that, that was the first I knew. So in, instead of going to the sites of Berlin, I, I was burrowing around in uh, Holos Holocaust archives and seeing my grandfather's name there. That must have shocked you. Yes, it did. Yeah, and it also made me distrust everyone in the family because at that stage I, I thought, you know, this is such a big 
big secret and you've kept this hidden all my life. What else are you not telling me? Do you ever feel guilty? No, I don't. I think I felt guilty for a good few years, but I think I started to shed it when I felt that speaking about my grandfather's story, and particularly speaking to, to young people and to, to Jewish people, I, I, I could become, in a very, very small way, a force for good. I could say to people openly and honestly, I come from a Nazi background and I do not share those beliefs. And, and my belief is that we can, we can fight this hatred with kindness and understanding. And, and so all, all my guilt disappeared. I mean, I, I never knew my grandfather. He, he died before I was born. Um, my father is, is, is no longer around. So I can't hurt him by telling him what his father was really like. Um, so no, I don't, I don't feel guilt at all now. Well, I think there have been so many accounts of of the Holocaust from the from the victims' point of view, and of course, Noemi is one one tremendous example because I think her father's book is is such a, a balanced and careful account, and humane account, and and it, it's it's an account that that tells us so much. But there's very, very little from, from a perpetrator perspective. Um, and so I, I do feel it's, it's important because he wasn't, my grandfather wasn't a brute. He was mind numbingly mediocre. He was an ordinary man who moved from one bad thing to the next, to the next, to the next. He slipped into a category of crimes that had he perhaps at the very beginning been shown where he would be going, he might have been a bit shocked. Yes, I think when the book came out three and a half years ago, there wasn't the same sense of the rise of the far right, totalitarian government, and people in charge of governments who emboldened these people to speak out. And so I think it's become more relevant as the years have gone on. And I think also the, the Holocaust itself is, is a very European kind of genocide. It, it shares some similarities with, with genocides such as Rwanda, but the African experiences are very different in many respects. And I think a country like Germany that was a very similar country to Britain, if they can go down that line, then why can't we? And what, what, happened, what made it happen in Germany and what didn't make it happen and what should never make it happen in this country.
And that feels of fundamental importance to me. If your grandfather was here right now, what would you ask him? Why? Why? How do you feel about what you did? How do you feel about your memories of going to concentration camps and, and seeing the human suffering? What did you feel for the people who were suffering? Did you feel anything?